you don't have to look at what your past business successes are. You can just look back at any success that you've had and said, yeah, that, that didn't, it took effort. It didn't come easy. Or even take a look at, you know, if you've built an audience on TikTok, that wasn't necessarily easy. There's a lot of people trying to do that. And if you are that person that you've built a serious audience and, and you feel like they're connected with you and you've got some type of relationship with them and you understand them, you've achieved something really big. And just because TikTok, if, you know, we don't know it's going to go away. We have absolutely no, we, we, and we might just be the best sure. We don't know, but even if it does, you've, you did something really hard and you can do it again. Hello, Launch Family. My name is Chris, and I'm very excited to have you listening to today's episode. As always, I am joined by my co-host, Mr. Jeff Walker. Hey, everybody. And today's episode, we have an interesting topic for you. Uh, and I don't want to say it's like an emergency broadcast, but it's kind of like a spontaneous decision to have this conversation uh, about the recent TikTok ban or potential TikTok ban that got passed in the U.S. Congress recently. Um, and so, Jeff, you actually mentioned to me, you wanted to chat about this. And um, I I can tell that uh, that you're kind of, a lot of people are freaking out about this conversation, right? So um, is there anything you want to say before we kind of explain what this situation is before people and why you want to talk about it? First of all, we don't tend to do topical things. We don't, we, we aren't of the news. We, I, I just, I want to build stuff that's going to help entrepreneurs this, this month, next year, five years from now, 10 years from now. So we don't tend to be super topical, but this is, this is some, it's a big news item here in the United States. Uh, and it, it, I thought it, there are some, big time lessons here. There's things to be done, lessons to be found. And so, yeah, I thought we would talk about this. Do you want me to give a little context on what this whole situation is? And then we can dive into it. Cause I definitely have some questions uh, for you. And I think it is, there's some business lessons for people out of this. Um, you know, this TikTok ban uh, is essentially, TikTok is owned by a Chinese company called ByteDance. And in China, they have controls and regulations over Chinese businesses, and specifically the government does. And so it requires those businesses to share certain information, data with their government. Um, this is in contrast to how it works in the USA, where a company like Facebook has no obligations to divulge data on private citizens to the government, and they, uh, and they can't get it without a warrant or proper cause, that kind of thing. And so the concern is that the US government thinks the Chinese government is collecting information on American citizens, and it could lead to you know, things that are bad for the USA's global interests. And uh, so this is interesting because it's not technically an outright ban and it hasn't necessarily happened yet because it still has to pass the Senate. It's gone through Congress. Uh, President Biden has indicated he will probably sign it into law if it does pass the Senate, uh, but it hasn't even gone to the floor yet. But what it basically means is they're going to either sell TikTok to a company in the US, so it's US owned, or they're going to ban it outright. And so this is a, a fairly large macro level event that I think is going to affect a lot of businesses and people and influencers at a micro level. Um, and I think that's the angle. This is not turning into a political podcast, right? Uh, Jeff, we're not here to talk about the, the politics behind all of this, right? <laughs> Um, I, no, I absolutely don't have enough confidence in, in in myself to talk about politics. That's for sure. Yeah. Last yeah. thing I want to talk about here. Exactly, but but I think the the, the perspective that we were we wanted to take on this is that, you know, there have been thousands of people who are uh, mailing and calling their Congress people and senators to try and get this bill stopped. Many businesses are, are worried about TikTok going away because of the amount of attention that it gets them. But you seem unnaturally calm about this whole situation, Jeff. And I, I wanted to start with like, one, why aren't you freaking about, out about this? And do you do you even have a TikTok? <laughs> well, let me get back to that in just a second. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, you know, this is, I just, Chris, I just saw this on the internet. I don't know if it's true or not that there were 170 million users uh, in the US. Yeah. Now, I had heard a number of 100 million earlier. So like I said, this is just something I saw on the internet. I don't know if I could, should believe it or not, but there's a lot of TikTok users here. A ban would be, it'd be big time. It would be crazy. 
And even at the vestiture, we don't know exactly what that would look like, but it would be a big deal. And you have to find, they have to find a buyer, right, yeah. for, for that. But, you know, India has banned TikTok. So it's not mm -hmm. like this hasn't already happened somewhere in the world. Uh, you know, India, obviously a huge population, I think possibly the largest population of any country. I'm, I'm not sure if they've passed China or not, but it, they're, they're neck and neck, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you know, the, the, this is potentially a, a, a great big deal. And like Chris said, we don't want to talk about politics. I also want to say, you know, I'm based in the U S uh, Chris is actually in Canada. So, but, but since the start, my audience has been international. I, you know, at least 40%, at least 40% of our audience is outside the U.S. But I think the bigger picture here isn't what the lawmakers in U.S. are going to do, but how entrepreneurs need to respond to these type of things. So, Chris, no, I do not have a TikTok <laughs> account. Uh, I, I almost like I feel like I'm going to lose my marketer, marketing guru merit badge when I say that. <laughs> Uh, but no, I don't. I mean, I've certainly looked at the at, at the platform. I've investigated it just to stay up to speed because it's it's my job. But it's not something I felt comfortable with having on my phone, specifically for this reason. Really, well, mm -hmm. for a couple of reasons. One one is I didn't want the Chinese government to have access to everything I looked at and know all my all all my patterns uh, online and and the level that they would care about me. Who knows? But well, I'm sure they wouldn't care about me, but um, yeah, I just, it felt a little creepy having that on my phone. And also I think we all, as entrepreneurs, we, you know, no one's sending us a paycheck if we don't show up and get stuff done. And every social app that you have on your phone, uh, I think it, it steals your focus. I mean, that's their job. That's really, really smart yeah. uh, scientists um, and engineers are, it's their job to create something that is absolutely addicting. And it seems like TikTok is probably top of the game right now. It's, so. it's a hundred percent the best at it. Like I actually, I had some stats on this. I looked up because if, if you weren't aware about TikTok or if you haven't used it, like if you just even open the app, you're, you're, you've lost 10 or 20 minutes sometimes, you know, it's, it's just gone. Um, but in fact, as according to the stats, you're right. It's like 170 million users. Um, I, I read the stat that a large portion of, the, of people who are who are there are using it for between like 60 to 90 minutes a day. It's like one of the most engaging apps in the world, or it is the most engaging of all the social media apps um, in the world. Maybe Facebook, I think, in the U.S. has a little bit close to that um, with uh, with them, but it's it's huge. I mean, like 52 minutes, I think, is the global average. I'm not sure what the U.S. is, but it's it's high. And that's a lot of time that people are on an app. That's a lot of time, potentially, or attention that people are giving towards what's happening on TikTok. So you're right. It's it's highly engaging, highly addictive, I think, too. And uh, in many cases, I think a lot of businesses are finding it fairly useful to be able to garner that 60 to 90 minutes worth of a tension that Americans are are placing there, right? Did you have any data on the demographics, like totally, age range? Totally, yeah. yeah. Um, 25, actually I have really detailed demographics on this if you want, but 25% of TikTok's active users are between 10 to 19, 22% are 20 to 29, 21 to 22% are between 30 to 39, 20% are 40 to 49, and 11% is age 50 or older. 60% um, tends to be female, 40% tends to be male. Uh, yeah, those are the main stats that I have. Everything else about kind of time uh, that is spent on the app. You know, you had asked me about, you know, being calm in the face of this, and it's easy for me because I don't have skin in the game. We haven't built a following on TikTok. Uh, and, and one of the, you know, there's a myriad of reasons, but w one of them is that my audience tends to skew 30 and higher and even 35 and higher. So I think that the TikTok audience tends to skew younger than some of the other platforms. So yeah. for me, it's easy to say I'm not worried because I don't have any skin in the game. But the reality is that I've always been focused on building, you know, the, the term I've seen used before, and I think it's accurate, is when you're building on social media, you're, you don't own that. You're building on rented land. 
and that rented land could go away at any point. And when I say go away, it means your account could go away. You could get banned for for no good reason. I've seen this on almost every platform where I've, I've got friends who ran totally clean uh, accounts, no spamming, no nefarious activities, and they've lost their account. In fact, I a year over a year ago now, I lost my personal Facebook account. I don't have a personal Facebook account at this point because, and there was they just banned me one day. And I think from digging into it, I think there was a lot of people trying to hack it. So they just shut it down. You could lose your account overnight. Um, you could, or the, or the platform could go away. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're talking about with TikTok. It potentially the platform goes away, but there's plenty of others. I mean, we were, before we started recording, we were talking about Vine. Yeah. You know, Vine was a thing for, for a minute. It was the TikTok and, before TikTok, really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was. It was. And, it, you know, it was seemed like it was going places and then it wasn't. And it just went away. Um, what was that one that Google started? That Google, I forget. Circles? Was it? Uh, Something like that. Google was, Plus? Is Google Plus what it was? The it social might media? Have been. See, we I, don't even remember. I don't even know. Exactly. I remember it used circles. And at one point, Google said every, the, the, they were so all about it. They said that the bonus for every single employee of Google was going to be tied to the success of that platform. And they, and then it just, all of a sudden, they decided to get out of the business a year later. And, you know, remember MySpace. And uh, you know, it just goes on and on. Platforms come and go. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, and then people get canceled. We can talk about more and more. I know you got a lot of questions for me, and I've been <laughs> rambling here. But there's also like so many examples. Well, the reason I have so many questions for you, Jeff, is because you've been doing business online. I mean, PLF has been around since 2005. And even before that, you were marketing and launching uh, your own business online. And so there's there's a tremendous amount of experience. And I'm sure there are storms that you have had that have come through from a macro level. And it might have been some of these platforms, for example, go away, but it could have been even, you know, like crashes in stock markets or there's probably, uh, you know, macro level events that, that were happening, like COVID, for example, like anything like that, that you have found ways to weather the storms and continue to succeed and outlast a lot of other digital marketers who kind of come and go, which I've heard you say that before. It's like, we, we've we been around a lot longer than most. My first business, which I ran for eight years was, it was publishing about the stock market. I basically had a newsletter that was all about the stock market. And when 9-11 happened, that shut down the stock market for a week. And then it just led to a crazy bear market in the, in the stock market where no one was interested in stocks anymore. And that was that was like the first big storm I had to weather, and then there was the financial crisis, uh, you know, of two thousand eight. That that was another massive crash, and and then um, and then yeah, we had COVID, and it's it's happened over and over that these big macro level things hit, and it is there are storms that you have to weather. That's the reality as entrepreneurs. We I mean we get paid to solve problems, and. And those problems never go away. And that's why we never come out of business because there's always going to be problems. And some, some of those problems are the problems that our clients have, but they're also, they could be uh, macro events. Um, they could be problems within our business. They could be problems within our team. And we just have to show up and solve them. And sometimes it is a matter of weathering the storm. You know, and it, those first couple that I mentioned when the stock market crashed and no one's interested in the stock market anymore. And it's like, OK, well, I, I knew from studying history, I, when, when I started that business, and I was so interested in the stock market and in investing. I went and I read the Wall Street Journal back to when it first started which is about 125 years ago. And when you do that, it gives you perspective that, you know, there's been many crashes throughout the, the market history and every time it came back. And so that's like the first thing is when you're in a storm, it's hard, you know, it's emotional. You, you, your gut's churning away. You're wondering if the sun's going to come up tomorrow. You're wondering if you're going to be able to stay in business. Well, you know, the sun is going to come up tomorrow. Uh, at least the evidence points to it. And, and you just, there, there's a time to hunker down and to say, you know, this too shall pass. And that, I mean, there's, there's a lot to be said about this, 
But the reality is, is as an entrepreneur, you're going to be challenged and you're going to be challenged by external events and your job is to overcome them. What's come up for me is that, you know, in business, you really have to expect the unexpected, right? And this is an example of things where, you know, in business, there are things we can control and there are things that we can't control. Are, I'm curious from your perspective, having gone through a lot of these types of of changes, are there business structures that you have put in place that have allowed uh, your business to weather these storms of tumultuous times and other macro events like this? Well, I think the number one thing is to build an audience and build it in a place where you have control of that audience. And that's what I was talking about social. You know, you could you could lose your account or the, the platform could lose, lose its reach or they could change the rules of how they're going to distribute your content. And so, you know, the one online mechanism that that you can truly control is your email list. And, uh, you know, I've for it's about it's been at least probably 10 years that people have been telling me that email is dead. In fact, no, it's been it's been 20 years since that people have been telling me that email is dead to get on with it. Um, the first one was a guy, he was literally the person who wrote the first book on email and email marketing. And by, it was 2003, he was over it. And he's like, email is dead. I was at a small little mastermind with him and he literally got up on the table and he was stamping his feet, standing on the table saying, email is dead, email is dead, email is dead, email is dead. And this is the guy who wrote the first, the first book on email marketing. I mean, standing on the table, I can still see him. He's like, RSS, Every, go RSS. That's where it's at, RSS, RSS. Well, needless to say, he wasn't right in 2003. And we've had, I've had people telling me this over and over. Now, now, is it, and I say that as someone who's been inside so many launches that either I have done or I've seen, helped my clients with, I've coached my clients through. And when you push that send button on your email, that send to your email list, and we're not talking spam, of course, we're talking people that have opted in. The acceleration, it's just like, I was in one of those um, Teslas with like the ludicrous mode. Chris, have you ever been like, <laughs> No, is that like oh. extra speed or what? I don't... It is. They have this, like you can literally download the ludicrous mode <laughs> and it makes it even faster. So it's already insanely fast because it's an electric vehicle and it's all the power immediately. And the, it literally, it snapped my neck. It made me feel sick to my stomach. Oh, wow. <laughs> I mean, it, it was nuts. It was Joe Polish had, has one or had one. And it, it's just, yeah, crazy. But that's what pushing that send button feels like. It's all, but you could just watch the stats within seconds, mm -hmm. within minutes, you can see the traffic coming in to your site because we can track that stuff, right? And there are there are very, very few people that have a social media following that, that has that type of, uh, of impact when they, when they post. And so, you know, email, you know, really podcast. Podcast is another distributed mechanism that you don't necessarily own the platform, but you own that content and the way people consume podcast is so distributed that it's in some way, well, it's a lot safer than say a social account. It's all, your, your, your podcast is not going to get banned, right? And so, you know, for me, like focusing on building on those type of, well, those two platforms, yes, you absolutely want to build on social, but you want to use social to drive over to those things that you that, that you actually control, that you own, number one being email. You know, Chris, Chris like I know earlier, um, before we started, I was telling you about like another, like there's this thing called the Google Slap. And I'm going yeah. to say this was like 2005 or so. So I'm sorry about giving everyone these, these ancient history lessons. Sorry, I haven't actually heard of Google Slap, so... So back in the day, it was basically Google reach, coming in and making a massive change in their algorithms on how they ranked websites. And I knew several people that had built up very nice businesses doing like high six figures, low seven figures, just by taking by by putting out good content and getting traffic in from Google, and and then having that and then having AdSense on their pages, which is like a Google advertising platform. And so people would come from Google and to this content, they'd read the content, 
content, some small portion of them would click on an ad. And then the person who owned that website that owned that content would get, uh, get a piece of that advertising. And like I said, I, I can think of one friend who had super high content. In fact, his, high, his content was so high, it was such high quality that he was a, a nationally syndicated columnist and his, his um, columns ran in like something like 70 or 80 newspapers around the United States. And he, he had rights to this content, so he would put that content on his website. So this, it, this wasn't spammy content. This was content that like 70 newspapers thought was good enough to publish. And he had built up over years and years, hundreds and hundreds of these columns, and he was highly ranked. This is a, this is a tiny little niche. Well, it's actually a big niche, but very niche down. And he would get this amazing traffic and he would make, you know, a million dollars a year by just putting up this content and have Google sending him organic traffic. Wow. And and then they just changed their algorithm and all of a sudden his pages didn't rank. And he had done he he didn't do anything nefarious, he didn't do anything wrong, he just put out good content. But it, Overnight, he lost almost 95% of his content, somewhere between 90 and 95% of his content. So he went from, you know, a million dollars a year to $75,000 a year, just because Google made a change in an algorithm. Now, Google can, can use whatever algorithm they want. It, you know, it's their business, right? But that just goes to show how you have to be careful the business model that you build. And, you know, I think like, I think at the end of the day, you you either get paid. This this game, business, online business, is essentially an arbitrage game, and in an arbitrage game, it's it's like can it costs you money to attract people to your website, to your properties, to become part of your audience, and then you try to find a way to extract some money from that audience. And I know that might that word might trigger a few people that might sound a little mercenary, but that's the reality. You're bringing in traffic and you're trying to sell that traffic on something. Now, you might be in his case, he was trying to sell advertising on his site. And I think that's inherently a difficult model to make work in the long run. That's why I'm a big fan of selling your own products, building out your own products and selling your own products as opposed to an advertising based model. Because you know, advertising that you're again, you're at the whims of of too many other things to you're, you're, you're at the whims of who's ever wanting to advertise whatever, whatever platform they're you, they're buying their ads through. There's all kinds of people making rules up that you cannot control. Hey, launch family. Uh, we'll get back to the episode in just a minute. But I wanted to ask you, do you have questions for us? launch questions, podcast questions, business questions, because we're actually looking to do a few Q&A shows for this 2024 season. And we would love to help any of you out there who have questions. So in order to send us your question, you can actually leave us a voicemail at daretolaunchshow.com. When you get there, just click on the ask a question tab and leave us a quick voicemail with your question and you may be featured in one of our upcoming episodes. We would love to hear from you. That's daretolaunchshow.com to submit a question and a voicemail. Now let's get back to the episode. Even on social media right now, I mean, you see it, the, the engagement statistics and Instagram has slowly diminished and diminished, diminished because their business model is ads, right? And the same thing happened with Facebook. It was initially huge amounts of engagement and, you know, ads was sort of the secondary thing. And then ads became the thing on Facebook because of the, 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 the model, right? The model for Facebook was we're going to sell ads. So we're going to diminish organic content. And now you have to pay to play on platforms like that. And so if you were, whereas email, you've said that before, it's, it's your only asset that you always have control over. You own it, right? Um, it's not rented ground. So I'm curious is, you know, if you were say, a prominent TikTok influencer right now who is sitting in this and saying like, oh my gosh, my entire business is built upon this attention that TikTok provides for me. What advice would you tell them right now? So first of all, you know, I feel for those folks. Um, this has just got to be a, a really rugged time, a really rugged moment. And so 
uh, I don't want to diminish that that pain and anguish in any way. One of the things about an audience is that some portion of that audience, there's this term, Chris, fungible. It's a financial term. And that when something is fungible, like cash is the ultra, probably the ultimate fung fungible thing is you can take that cash and you could turn it into another asset. You could buy a house with it. You could buy crypto with it. You could buy stocks with it. You could buy gold with it. You can buy food with it. So, um, and, and a lot of financial instrument, instruments are fungible at some level. You know, gold can be transferred from gold to cash to crypto. And whereas something like a house is a lot less liquid and a lot less fungible. I think the one great thing about audiences is to some extent, they are fungible. So you can move people to a different platform. So right now I'd be, and not everyone, like, in fact, I know someone who has a built a business around finding celebrities with huge social followings that don't, that don't monetize it in any way. So maybe like celebrities, like, like, you know, music stars or, or, or movie stars, just people, you know, with millions of followers, but they're not doing anything with those followers. And it's great that they built that audience. And it gives them power like over, over their career that they didn't have before. But this person has built a business around going to those people. Very, I'm Chris, some really big names, really big names you would know. And working with them to move their audience to an email list and then actually helping them create a course and sell that course. And his like his typical, he would be able to move people from Insta at about six to seven percent, depending on the audience, depending on the celebrity, about six or seven percent, which doesn't sound like much. But, you know, if you start off with four million followers, six or seven percent is a pretty big number to get them on an email list and engage in an email list. So what I would be if I was on TikTok and I and there was this danger, I'd be like, first, what what other platform could I send them to? Um, could I get them to follow me on Instagram? Could I get them to follow my, me, my YouTube shorts? And then, you know, could I actually get them to come on over to my website for some additional piece of, of content, some additional level of connection and join my email list? So yeah, I, the, the great thing is if you've built an audience, you've done it once, you know how to do it again. And I would look at moving that audience probably first to another social platform that does a similar like shorts, like TikTok does. And then I, I would, I would, uh, in conjunction, I would also be trying to get them over to an email list. Yeah, I've seen that. I've already seen people who are on TikTok because I do have a TikTok account, but um, it is one of those things that I've seen people who are freaking out about this saying, you know, hey, I'm also going to be posting this content in on YouTube. And I've seen people who have been like, here's a YouTube video of all the TikTok posts I made in the last week or in the last two days or whatever it is. And they uh, they are now starting to garner subscribers on a different platform like YouTube uh, or moving them towards, say, uh, Instagram, where Instagram, it's, it's not crazy hard through messenger apps or things like that to have people opt into your list. You know, uh, you've probably seen this before where people say, oh, you know, post launch underneath our video or whatever, and you'll be able to, and you'll see a messenger, I'll message you with, with this opt-in. And that's a, that's a viable model to get people onto a list. Yeah. Um, you know, getting people to follow you on a podcast like this too. It's like, Hey, to get more of our content going, going to your website and opting in for, for more info on the podcast. Those are all great ways to, uh, to get something that you own. Right. Uh, yeah. Actually, I wanted to just ask you about something like, how do you feel about the, how do you feel about say like text messages in this universe of, you know, emails and texting and messengers and social media? Like where does, where do where does collecting, say, phone numbers come into this for you? It's something that we do. It, it's 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 a super powerful tool. Um, we do it in right in line with people joining our email list. We do it, and um, you know there there are certainly legalities around it, and and it, it's a the tone of the communication is is going to be different than an email. But you know every platform has its own its own tone that that you need to hit but yeah text absolutely
hundred percent. Have there been any habits that have served you or have been really invaluable for you throughout these types of macro level uh, tumultuous events that happen um, when you're running your business? One of the habits I have is like collecting stories, especially if it's of people I know, but collecting stories of people being resilient. Um, you know, I know one of the, the, the biggest challenges I ever had, I think, in business was, and Chris, we might have talked about this on another podcast. I can't remember. Um, but it was when I had my business stolen from me. So I mm. built that first business and I ran it with a partner for about eight years. And then one day he decided he didn't need me as a partner anymore. And he just informed me that he was starting a competing business and was planning on taking all of our paying customers. And I was actually, I was actually sitting at this desk in this place right here when I got that call. And it was actually, this was in 2005. And so I actually had a phone like with a cord on it and I picked it up and he, and, you know, he told me this, he was taking, he was starting a new business and he was taking our clients. And so I hung that phone up and, and, um, and, and I'm like, okay, that was a five minute call that just, I just lost this business I've been building for eight years. And, you know, that was the beginning of a, you know, a six month saga of talking to way too many lawyers and, and, um, and it, it was just ugly. It was like an ugly divorce. Um, and, and that was a super big gut check. But at that point I had friends, one in particular who I knew had lost his entire business due to a regulatory issue and just literally been completely put out of business and dragged through the mud. And I saw him turn it around and I'm like, if, if he can do it, I can do it. And so I'm always looking around, trying to find examples of people who have had challenges that, that have overcome them. It's even better if their challenges were bigger than my challenges. And, you know, like you can go, this is one thing I think it's going to make your life as an entrepreneur easier is like, if you look around and see, see someone having great success, if you learn to, instead of feeling jealousy and envy to celebrate that success, I think it just put you way ahead. And that's a bit of a sidebar because, but I just like to watch other entrepreneurs, love to talk to other entrepreneurs and learn about their successes and learn about their habits and, and learn about the way they operate, but also learn about their challenges and learn about those, those crucible moments where it seemed those all, all is lost moments to use a movie story based theme or it's, yeah, that all, everything's lost. And somehow they're able to pull it out. And so I look for those stories among my friends, among people I listen to on podcasts, on YouTube videos, wherever, because like if they can do it, I know I can as well. I'll do it my own way. It'll be different. It'll look different. But and then at one point you'll wake up 10 years from now and you'll have all your own stories because you you'll have been battered left and right, but you'll have overcome them over and over. Well, I think that uh the demographics on TikTok are gen generally trending towards younger, as we've already mentioned, right? Part of the reaction, I think, to this ban has been that the young people are, they don't have that story or that experience to know that even though your TikTok may go away or that there will be these macro level events, and, and sometimes they're micro, like you said, your business was almost taken from you by someone you knew and had been in partnership and was a good friend or, you know, a close person for a long period of time. And we'll have to tell that story sometime if it's not already out. You, I'm sure hit follow so you can get that because it's going to it's going to be a story we cover in more detail. But but I'll say it, there's a lot of fear for those young people when they when they, when something like this happens. But what you're saying is that there is hope, right? Like there's if you talk to any entrepreneur who's had any level of success over time, they have had a story like that. I mean, I've got, I, I get it when you're starting out. It does, it, it, I could see someone, they might be 17 years old and just built up this huge TikTok audience and and it, life is awesome. And all of a sudden they're going to have that thing taken away. Boom. And, and yes, yeah, scary. It would make me, if I, I'd make me angry. Um, but that's, you know, I, I guess I'm not a spring chicken. I got the gray hair to prove it. And um, there is certain things that come 
with the age and one of them is experience and hopefully another hopefully is wisdom and you've seen storm after storm after storm and and you weather them you don't have to look at what your past business successes are you can just look back at any success that you've had and said yeah that that didn't it took effort it didn't come easy or even take a look at you know if you've built an audience on TikTok that wasn't necessarily easy there's a lot of people trying to do that and if you are that person that you've built a serious audience and and you feel like they're connected with you and you've got some type of relationship with them and you understand them you've achieved something really big and just because TikTok, if you know we don't know it's going to go away yeah, we, we have know. absolutely no we we and we might just be the best sure we don't know but even if it does you you did something really hard and you can do it again you mm -hmm. can absolutely do it again yeah the person you are or who you became through that process of creating an audi audience is actually what's valuable not the audience itself right yeah exactly are, are there other mindsets because we're talking about the mindset of looking at this right and i, and I, I read a, a quote when i was uh looking this up and it's a chinese proverb ironically for this TikTok situation a chinese company um but a crisis is an opportunity riding a dangerous wind are there other mindsets that have been really useful to you in moving through these times of crisis where there is a dangerous wind what makes business go around is relationships. And if you, I mean, it's relationships with your, with your prospects, the people that haven't bought from you yet, it's relationships with your clients, two of the most important relationships, relationships with other people in the market, other, other providers, other entrepreneurs. So if, you know, you see this all the time in social where people are collaborating with each other, which is amazing. Those relationships, no matter what happens to any given platform, no matter what storm comes across you, those relationships are incredibly powerful. I have probably, you know, a couple dozen at least people I could just reel off one after another after another that like if I lost everything, if I just lost every bit of my influence, every bit of my audience, every bit of my business, every bit of my money, I could call them up and and say, hey, you know, can I have the shirt off your back? I, I've got nothing. I no longer have anything. I can't give you anything. The best I can do is promise if you help me out now, I can try somehow to repay you in the future. I bet yeah, easily I could name two dozen probably three or four dozen people of very significant influence who have very significant businesses that I am a hundred percent confident would say, absolutely, Jeff, what do you need? And that's just because I've been building those relationships for decades. Like the thing that will help you weather any storm, it, it's sort of like that, you know, the, the, the dig, the, dig your well before you're thirsty, build those relationships, build them in your industry, I build them with your clients, build them with the, the people who haven't even bought from you yet. At the end of the day, like I said earlier, we get paid to solve problems. We get paid to create value for people. And the more you lean into showing up and being of service and taking care of your people, the, the more resilient you will be. Are there other opportunities that during this time of crisis, because I think that there is always two ways to look at it. There's crisis and challenge, right? Where there's tons of challenges, but within every challenge, there is a way to find opportunity. And are there opportunities that you see in this TikTok ban crisis that entrepreneurs or people who are on TikTok could really take advantage of versus be a victim to? Yeah, I think, um, so first of all, it's, it's an opportunity to re-examine your business model. Uh, and that, that, I mean, that when things are just sailing along fine, you know, we all tend to just be like, okay, I'm comfortable here. So it's, that's the first blessing is it's a chance to re-examine your business model. The other one is something like this can galvanize your audience. Mm -hmm. They can, it can, it can rally your audience. And they could rally around you. You could be the rallying point. And that is a super, super powerful place to be in, to, to have this community that's rallying 
that you're rallying with and for and that's rallying around you. And you know, don't underestimate that. Say, hey, hey, boy, this has happened. None of us are happy about it, but we're all in this together and we're going to figure this out. And this is what I'm doing. And this is where I'm thinking about going in, in, in this time of, of need, a time of peril. Yeah, I've always um, thought that when there's something that is happening that objectively everyone in, is saying is bad, how could you say that it's good? And is there a way for people to channel that? Because I think hope and positive messaging and things tends to always be long term a good thing, right? People tend to resonate more or look for that um, online, even though it seems that everybody wants to go into the negative and, you know, say this is bad or whatever. Could you cut through with a positive message? And as you mentioned, re-examining your business in some way, how could this be good for you over the next, say, decade or 15 or 20 years. And as a young person, some of you might have a hard time thinking about that, right? Over if you've only been here for 17 years and you have 17 million followers on TikTok, it could be challenging for people to think about 10 years or 15 or 20 years into the future of how this one ban actually built a business that lasted for a decade or more because of the it forced you into looking for the opportunity. But I really think there's there's something there for people who are in that situation to mindset, look at the opportunity that is within it and how it could serve you for a lot longer than just the next six months or the next, you know, year with this uh, with this ban. Are there is there anything else that you want to say to people who might be looking at this ban and saying, man, I'm going to have to do something about this? You know, Chris, I would just. What you just said had so much wisdom in it. You know, this isn't going to be anyone's last challenge or last problem. If you're an entrepreneur, if you're building a business, this is just the latest. There's going to be more. Um, just just trust in yourself. Trust that uh, entrepreneurs are smart people and they, they solve problems and they always figure things out. When I was, um, I don't know, I, this is maybe two, 2003. I keep on telling these ancient stories. It's just, but I guess I'm just trying to give some perspective. And and back then I was still in my stock market business and it was going along. And there was a guy who was sort of in the, the guru world, the, the marketing guru world, who I thought was really brilliant. I really liked a lot. Everything about him was great. And everything he said, I paid attention to and I learned from him. And at one point he, he came out with a really bold statement. It was like, you know, what's going to be big online? is video video and so this is 2003 video is going to be big online and you know we were several years away from really having video really happen but video is it's gonna it's gonna take over online and when video takes over it's so hard to produce video and it's so complicated and it's so costly to get all the equipment that What's going to happen is all the, the TV studios are going to come in and they're going to win. So right now, all of us little guys are doing well. All, we've invented this whole new industry of online publishing and online business. And we've had a great run for the last eight or 10 years, but it's all about to end because when it goes to video, then it's just going to be the people that know how to do video are the ones that will take over the entire internet. <laughs> and obviously, he was 100% correct with his first prognostication. It's like, yeah, video is has taken over. Video is king online, absolutely. But the second part was completely wrong because tools and technology came along. Entrepreneurs invented things that made it all of a sudden easy for everyone to do video. And so I guess what I'm saying is that us humans, we're pretty smart. We're good at fixing things. Entrepreneurs are, are, are amazing at, at, at solving problems. And so, you know, TikTok goes away. That it, it will be a big story. It'll be a crazy big story. And something else will fill that vacuum. And, yeah. the, and the winners are going to win. I mean, think about if it does, what could fill that gap of attention, right? I mean, there's 90 minutes a day that's now 
you know, hopefully some of that goes back to family and friends, you know, <laughs> hopefully right. we get back right. to doing some of the most important things or maybe back to your business even. Right. Um, right. But what is going to be the next thing? There may be another platform that steps in and for sure, Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and all those platforms that are already there are going to take some of that. But there is always opportunity for something else might come around another platform that all of a sudden now that's what gets the attention and something's going to fill that void or attempt to fill that void. And maybe that's where you uh, you can garner more attention. And maybe it's even better than TikTok for you and allows you to build something that you own like a like an email list even easier. Because I think it's a little challenging to actually take people from TikTok to an email list. It's a little challenging to do that, which is one of the reasons why I think we haven't been on TikTok that much um, right. with, with, uh, with PLF. But it really is something that where there's a challenge and where there's something that you can't control, focusing on the things that, that you can. You know, there's a, there's a saying that every end is a new beginning, right? And so when something ends, having them into the mindset and the mentality that this is really just the beginning of something new that could be bigger, greater, and even more valuable. I think that's a powerful mentality for any entrepreneur to maintain during this, this time period. And that's what I'm hearing when you, when you yep. say these things. Yeah. And look into the future. I mean, if, if TikTok doesn't get, you know, it, I don't know, what was the last time they were talking about banning TikTok, Chris? It, this isn't the first time. No, it's not. Yeah. This is not the, it's not the first time. And if it doesn't get banned, this probably won't be the last time either. So yeah. look into the future and say, if I'm building something on TikTok or any single one social platform, then I'm just setting myself up for disaster that one day I'm going to wake up and my account's going to be gone or the platform's going to be gone or the platform will be in decline or I'll be shadow banned. So look into the future and build a robust business. You know, again, this isn't to denigrate anyone who's, you know, especially someone, a young influencer who's like, this just took off. It was amazing. These are the, the, the days of milk and honey. It's fantastic. Fine. You, you, you had success there, but look into the future. You can't build a business on any single social platform. Yeah. And reminding yourself that you brought value too. That's one of the reasons why you built that platform or why you garnered so much attention. And that value is housed within you, not within the platform. So you can take that other places. You can find other mediums. You can transfer value to, to people in many different ways. It doesn't have to all be through this one social media app or through this one vehicle that you've, you know, found success in. And, uh, and that value is within you. Take it, take it to the, to the, to the next thing and, uh, and you'll find success there too. Any final thoughts for people on this one? No, Chris, I think we sort of pounded this one into yeah, the ground. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Hey, Launch Family, thank you so much for, uh, for listening to this. Um, we're always, uh, we're always looking out for you and, uh, we hope this conversation has inspired you to dare to launch. Mm -hmm.